Hi, everyone. Today I have Sal Litvak. He is many things. He's an award-winning filmmaker, a social media influencer, and the accidental Talmudist. He has over 1 million followers, especially on Facebook, but across many platforms. And today he's going to first tell us about his shared death experience, and that'll lead him into telling you the rest of where his journey has led him. Thank you, Sal. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so to understand, the, it was a very powerful, very powerful shared death experience that changed my life uh, and my grandmother's passing. Uh, but to understand why it was so special, you need to know a little bit about her. Her name was Magda. She was Hungarian. Um, and she grew up in a small town in Hungary called Kartzag, um, kind of a rural town. <clears throat> and as a teenager, you know, she, she had a crush on the town veterinarian. Uh, whose name was Imre, and who was about ten, who was 10 years older than her. When she became an adult, uh, he noticed her, and, uh, and theirs was a great, great love, uh, really a love for the ages. They got married. Um, they, uh, they actually had trouble conceiving, so it, it took quite a while uh, for them to, to, to have children. Uh, and they got married in 1932. Uh, uh, and so this period all through the 1930s, you know, the news was filtering into their small town that things were not good for the Jews uh, in, in, in Germany, uh, especially, of course, and in other countries. And, uh, the sort of, and in Hungary, you know, in, in many ways, they kept passing laws that were very anti-Semitic, barring Jews from government service and university professorships and things like that. And the laws just got worse and worse. Uh, eventually, uh, the war started. They had not fled Hungary, and so they were stuck in Hungary. Um, and, uh, and then amazingly, in 1944, is when she finally got pregnant, so 12 years later. Um, and, and tragically, before the baby was born, he was taken away uh, by the Nazis and ended up never meeting his daughter. Uh, he perished at Dachau. Uh, my grandmother uh, ended up giving birth uh, in this like sort of few days when they had the the Nazi advance party came, they gathered up all the Jews with the help of the local Hungarians who were only too happy to identify all the Jews in the town. Um, and then they were sort of temporarily in a ghetto awaiting the, the train cars that would take them, you know, where they were gonna go next. Uh, and during that period in the ghetto is when my grandmother gave birth. She was actually taken to a hospital I don't even think for a full day, a few hours, had the baby brought back into that ghetto. Um, and, uh, and then most of the people in that ghetto ended up going straight to Auschwitz. She was fortunate, very fortunate as a mother with a newborn, uh, that she was sent along with her parents uh, to a, a work camp. You know, uh, in other words, where they, not even a work camp, a farm. They were like picking crops. The, the, the Germans were very hungry by 1944 and they were using slave labor, uh, you know, to, to pick crops and provide food for the German army. Uh, so that lasted. My mother was born in May. That took all of the summer. Uh, and then when the food picking was done, they were sent to a concentration camp uh, to Theresienstadt. Um, and amazingly, my, my, my grandmother carried an infant through a concentration camp. I mean, you just don't hear a story like that very often. Um, and, uh, and they both survived. The, the baby is my mother. Uh, after the war, you know, many Jews who had lost their spouses sort of got busy and lost all their whole families. And they kind of got busy repopulating the Jewish people. Uh, you know, marrying, starting new families. And my grandmother was very happy for all those people and attended lots of weddings. Uh, but for herself, there was only Imre. And it was, like I said, it's just one of these great loves for the ages. And so it sounded like she was in a hurry, uh, but she would wait and to be reunited with him in the next world. And, uh, and so she just poured all of her love into her only child, her daughter, Kati. Uh, and then eventually they, they escaped Hungary in 1956. They ended up in Chile, uh, where a relative had gone. There she met my father, 
Uh, my father's side is a Ukrainian Jewish family that got to Chile in about 1905. I was born 1970, uh, and then Chile became communist, elected a communist president, Salvador Allende, and the Hungarians in the family said, you know, no way. <laughs> the Nazis were terrible, the communists were not much better. We're not staying here. And that's how we ended up in the United States. Um, I was born, my brother was born, and my grandmother, who sounds saintly, and she was a saint, uh, but she was also very funny, very personable, a great Hungarian cook. Uh, and she was just so devoted and poured all of her love into you know, her only daughter and then her two grandsons. Uh, eventually, it was 1997, and uh, I was living in LA at the time. My mother said, you know, come home. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's the end. My grandmother lived a nice long life. Um, she was, uh, you know, 88. <clears throat> uh, and, and what it was at the end was a melanoma that spread. Um, and, uh, and so she was in hospice. You know, I came home and I was at her bedside. Uh, at the moment of her passing, along with my mother and my brother. And, um, and so I, it's like I was sitting in a chair and her bed was right here. Uh, then, you know, then my mother was sort of like kneeling on the ground and, and holding my grandmother's hand and my brother doing the same kneeling on the ground right next to her. We're all holding her hands and telling her how much we love her. Um, and that it's okay, you're going to another place. My mother was, you know, crying. Like when, when, she, when my grandmother took her last breath, if you've ever been at a death, like you know when it's the last breath. Um, and so my mom was, was just weeping and weeping. We were all crying. And then the strange thing was that something pulled my attention from my grandmother's face right here to the middle uh, of, of her small bedroom in my parents' house. And it was like the air in the room started to shimmer. Um, and it's almost like if you ever look into a, a chandelier and all the crystal you know, sort of produces all the colors of the rainbow, it was something like an effect like that in the middle of the room. And then it seemed like something opened. Uh, and in this opening, I saw my grandmother, not as, you know, kind of cancer ridden, 88 year old lady, you know, dying and, you know, she'd always been petite and now she had just lost like so much body mass. She was so skinny, but now it was like the way I always knew her, like this, this wonderful uh, older lady. She was moving away from me and moving toward something, someone. And then I saw, oh my God, it's my grandfather. Well, you know, I obviously never met him. My mother never met her own father. Uh, but his photographs were all over our house always. And, uh, and she was moving toward him. And I'm like, oh my God, it's happening. She's been waiting her whole life to be reunited with him. And it's happening. This is unbelievable. And the strangest thing was she didn't want to go. It was almost like the image of like a puppy, you know, being dragged across the kitchen floor, doesn't want to go. She didn't want to go. I'm like, why wouldn't she want to go? And then I get it. it. He is, you know, young. Like the last time they were together in 1943. I guess he was taken away in 43. My mother was born in 44. Um, so uh, it's like the last time they were together. You know, he's still this young man. She's an old lady. And she's like, oh, you know, he's not going to want me. He reaches out, pulls her to him. They embrace. It gets brighter. All of a sudden she's young again, like the last time that they were together. They're kissing, it's super bright. It's like a scene that Hollywood always tries to do, you know, the big spectacular romantic ending. It could never do justice to the real thing. It was spectacular. And then it was really bright and then they were gone. And my mother, my brother are still sitting there crying, you know, such a, such a loss. And, 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 and tears are running down my face. And, but I had this like smile on my face because with her last moment in this world, my grandmother Magda gave me this, this peek beyond the veil or behind the veil. Um, and it changed my life. It changed my life. You know, I, uh, it's funny because I, I, I figured, well, whatever I saw 
there's, you know, a high chance, big chance that it's just my imagination. I just imagined this. I, I wanted this to be real, so I must have imagined it. Um, but, but it was so powerful. I was so shaken by it. Um, when I came back to LA, I, I just kind of wanted to honor her. Uh, you know, we always, we always had, like my grandmother always lit candles in the house. We would have a hala and, and make a, a blessing on the wine. I wouldn't even call it a full kiddish. Um, but I had a bar mitzvah in a conservative synagogue. Uh, but beyond that, like we were not very connected. I was personally not connected at all. You know, maybe you could get me to a synagogue on high holidays where I would be complaining about how boring it is and how many pages till we're done and, you know, Passover, oh my God, how many pages until the Sagat is over? When do we eat? Um, but now I, it's almost like for the first time in my life, I went to a synagogue on purpose, you know, not, not, not that I was dragged there. I just wanted to honor her and maybe just say Kaddish. Uh, I was fortunate that the rabbi who was speaking that day at this big, big synagogue that I happened to go to in LA, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe, really gifted speaker and teacher. Uh, and I was very moved by, 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 by his words, by his teaching, also by the, the singing, the davening. And I'd always been a very spiritual person. I was always like, it was a given to me that the world didn't burst into being randomly for no reason. Of course there's God, God made the world. And, and surely the creator's interested in the creatures. Uh, and I was interested in God and I was, uh, I, I pursued spirituality just in other places. Uh, you know, everything from Grateful Dead shows, long distance running, martial arts, drumming, meditation, um, but not Judaism. And so then, you know, that day in, in synagogue, I thought, well, maybe I should look for this thing I've been seeking in my own backyard because I really haven't given it a chance. And of course, I quickly discovered that, of course, Judaism is spiritual, is highly spiritual. You just have to go looking for that. And uh, I, I started learning and, and learning from, there's a lot of great teachers, a lot of great rabbis here in LA. Um, and, you know, sooner or later, every rabbi will mention the Talmud. And I would think, well, the Talmud is clearly full of wisdom. Uh, I don't really know what it is. I, I wouldn't know where to begin to, to learn Talmud, but uh, clearly it, it's full of wisdom. I'd like to get into it, but I not only don't know where it is or where to be, what it is or where to begin, I, I kind of thought maybe I'm not allowed. Maybe, you know, Kabbalah, you're supposed to be 40 before you start studying. Maybe Talmud, you need to be a rabbi in order to be allowed. I didn't know, I, I, you know, I never went to yeshiva. I just had no reference. Um, so whenever I would, as I was getting more involved in going to synagogue on Shabbat or taking classes or, you know, trying to become more spiritual and, 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 and a better Jew, as it were, uh, I would often go to the mitzvah store on, on Pico Boulevard to get a kippa or a prayer book or a book about something or a gift for someone. And there I would see those shelves of Talmud and to me, it looked like three Encyclopedia Britannicas. I mean, it's vast. The, the Art Scroll uh, Babylonian Talmud, which is the standard Talmud, is 73 volumes. I mean, it's, it's so big. <laughs> Where do you begin? How do you access that? I, I, I just figured, you know what? Maybe in another life, I'll, I'll have gone to a yeshiva and be able to study Talmud. But apparently in this life, it's not for me. And I had that thought process many times. Uh, but one time I was in that store, now it was 2005. And I, you know, had the same idea. I should check out the Talmud, but nah, it's too big, too intimidating, not for me. Walk away. And something stopped me. Like something turned my head in her room. Now something stopped me. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. They're just books. You know, I was an English major in college. Uh, my wife and I are a screenwriting team. I'm a director. We're, we're just book lovers. Our house is full of books. Why am I so intimidated by books? There must be a book one of the Talmud. I'll get that and see what it's like. I found book one. I took it to the counter. The kid at the register said, oh, you're doing Daf Yomi. I said, what's Daf Yomi? And he looked at me really funny, went like this. <laughs> As if to say, are you kidding? And I thought, oh man, Daf Yomi must be a code. If you don't know the code, you're not allowed to read the book. Now he's got to get rid of me without embarrassing me. This is so awkward. Uh, and he says, Daf Yomi is a program there where people around the world 
read the entire Talmud on the same schedule, one page a day. If you do that, it takes seven and a half years to read the Talmud. And today is day one. So I happen to buy book one of the Talmud on day one of a seven and a half year cycle of Talmud study. And the odds against that are ridiculous. So I said, okay, God, I get the message. I guess I'm doing Daf Yomi. A lot of people start Daf Yomi. They tend to have long beards <laughs> and the full yeshiva experience. And most of them do not finish Daf Yomi because it's such a big commitment. To read a page of Talmud a day, it, the Talmud is extremely dense. It, it, it's a writing down of an oral tradition with commentary layered on for centuries and centuries and centuries. That's why it's 72 volumes. So to read that one page, first of all, it's like 10 pages with all its notes and commentary, a very small print. And like, even if you speed through it, just trying to understand that on the most basic level, it's an hour a day. I mean, it's an hour a day, seven days a week. You know, it's Yom Kippur, do your daf. You're getting married that day, do your daf. You're sick, do your daf. You're directing a movie do your daf. <laughs> no one cares. You have that obligation if you're going to do this. Uh, and that's why so many people drop out of it. But I really felt like God put the book in my hand. So I had to stay with it. Uh, and I did. And in 2012, uh, I married it, thank God, to, to co it's called Completing Shas, uh, to get all the way through it. And, uh, and I learned so much and was so touched by it and changed in many ways. And I thought I should change my, I should tell my story. Um, and I, I talked to my friend David Suisse, who's the publisher of the Jewish Journal. He was a big fan of our first movie, Nina and I wrote and I directed, called When Do We Eat? A comedy about Passover. Uh, and, uh, and I told him this story. I said, if I wrote it up, would you publish it? My thought was I should write it up because maybe one other guy will read the story and, and try Dafyomi just because I had done it. Uh, and he said, oh, that story's amazing, Sal. That's a cover story for the Jewish Journal. But you should write a blog also to expand that audience and the number of people who may bump into you and then bump into Talmud. So The Accidental Talmudist was a cover story and a blog at the Jewish Journal. And if you have a blog, you should have a Facebook page to promote the blog. So it became a Facebook page as well. I really liked the Facebook aspect of it because in the blog, eh, it's an 800-word article once a week. Facebook, you can post every day, but one day it's just a verse, another day it's a little saying, another day it's a big article, another day it's a video, another day it's a live video. You know, that, that, that variety suited me. Uh, I, I do come from the entertainment industry, and so my goal was always to make this ancient wisdom uh, both accessible and entertaining. Um, so much of Torah that's online is, you know, a man with a long beard sitting in front of a bookcase. I love the books, but I think you need a, a little bit more visual approach to sharing Torah. Uh, and, and Nina joined me in this effort. We do everything together. And it's been a shock to us that somehow we became these people uh, sharing Torah and Talmud every day. And the audience grew and grew and grew. And now we have over a million followers in 70 countries. Uh, and so many people are touched by it and people are learning who wouldn't be learning otherwise. Uh, people who live in far flung communities where there is no rabbi, there is no synagogue, there's no access or people who had a bad experience with Judaism and we're not just bored, but we're alienated uh, and don't want to know from a rabbi. But I'm not a rabbi. <laughs> I'm not intimidating like a rabbi. Uh, and so just a lot of people have been touched by it and have become part of the accidental Talmudist community. And all of this that has happened and come from it, you know, would not have happened, but for that incredibly powerful shared death experience uh, by my grandmother's bedside. I'll just say one more thing. I've told this story many times as a public speaker. One time I was in Australia, um, this is quite a while ago. And uh, at this point, probably eight years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. And, uh, and I was telling the story. And, uh, and when I got to what I saw by my grandmother's bedside, I said, well, I'm sure it was my imagination, but, and then described it. And after the talk, a, a woman came up to me um, and she was very earnest. And she said, Seth, did you see it? 
I said, well, I, I mean, it was, you know, I, like I said, I, it might've been my imagination. It was very vivid. Did you see it? <laughs> yes, it was very vivid to me. Then own it. Because so many people have seen things, had, have had experiences like this. And so many feel like, well, if I share it, people will think I'm crazy or they, they, they won't believe it or I'm just far-fetched, it's this, it's that. And the more of us who tell our stories, uh, you know, the, the, the more stories will come out because people will realize that they're not alone in this. It, it, it's, it's amazing how many people have had experiences like this. And it's amazing how similar they are to each other. And it's not just some function of the brain, it's real. I mean, the, that upper world is real. Uh, and it's certainly given me confidence to have heard so many stories like that in telling my own. So ever since that, I don't say it must have been my imagination. I know it's real. Uh, and, and once you realize that that upper world is real, the world of souls is real, you come from that world. Uh, and I like to tell my community all the time that, you know, you don't have a soul. You are a soul, you have a body. Having a body is temporary. Being a soul is eternal. You're an eternal being, you're made of light. You come from the source of light and the source of souls. You're part of that and you're an expression of God's presence here like every other human. And, it's a, it's a, and you've come here with a mission, a holy mission. And so much of our lives is spent remembering who we are and what our mission is. And so I bless you all and all of us that, that, that we should contemplate on what our mission is and, 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 and do as much as we can to remember what our mission is and having remembered to execute on that mission. Thank you, Sal. I have a few questions first for people who don't know, how do you define, how do you describe what the Talmud is? Uh, it's, it's um, so the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai uh, many people think, well, that's the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. But in fact, the Torah came in two parts. It was given to Moses in two parts, the written Torah and the oral Torah. And it had to be given in two parts because it's an eternal document that will never change. Uh, and so, the, and, and the written document, which is, you know, like a, a covenant between us and God, and, and it regulates and mandates our behavior as Jews, for, for a document that's going to be the law forever, you know, for thousands of years, uh, it's very terse, it's very compact, and it doesn't handle every situation that's gonna come up, especially, I mean, could, could, could Moses and the children of Israel around Mount Sinai have imagined the internet, telephones, cell phones, drive-in movies, you know, uh, swimming pools? I mean, <laughs> our world is so different. And there are so many questions that come up because of it. And so what God gave to Moses was both the written law and a process for, for understanding and interpreting and applying the written law in every generation, even as the world changes. And so what that was, was there were a few laws that were actually just oral laws that, that, that are known as uh, laws that are Lemoshim Mi Sinai, to Moses at Sinai. So for example, in the written Torah, it says, uh, you know, that, that, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you shall bind these words as a sign upon your hand and they shall be a symbol before your eyes. So that refers to tefillin. But would you ever know <laughs> that tefillin, a black box with these words inside and the black straps that goes around your arm and goes over your forehead, comes from, it shall bind it as a sign upon your hand and be a symbol before your eyes. It, it, it's not spelled out at all. So the, what tefillin are was told to Moses at Sinai. But many other laws are sort of encoded in the written law and, and it you know, required our sages with a very careful and structured process uh, that was this oral Torah that passed from God to Moses, to Joshua, uh, to the elders, to the judges, to the prophets, to the men of the great assembly, uh, to the sages, right? And then from the sages to us. And, and so it's, it's, it's really what the Talmud is, is a fountain of, of law and lore and wisdom that commenced at Mount Sinai uh, and has been passed down through every generation. And then every generation added its wisdom 
to it. And that's how it has grown so big that it is 73 volumes. Um, but it's almost but like to be a Jew and not be connected at all to the Talmud, it, it, it's almost like you're not, you're not there. You're, you're, you're missing the, the central pillar. The Torah is it. It's the, it's the foundation. I mean, the written Torah. Um, but for the written Torah to find expression in your life, you need teachings from the Talmud. And, and we don't even realize, you know, if we don't have this kind of background, like I didn't have, that we do bump into the Talmud all the time. And one of the best examples is the Passover Haggadah. When you're reading the Haggadah, you're reading the Talmud. <laughs> and the kind of the way the sages are arguing about what it means and what we learn from it and you know when when we should do the seder and when we should say the prayers that that kind of discussion is a talmudic discussion and uh not only does it connect us to the tradition it also trains us how to think how to make distinctions uh you know we're not all the same we're not all built the same way we all have different potentialities uh, and understanding the distinctions between people, the distinctions between, you know, what is permitted food and what is prohibited food, what is permitted dress and what is prohibited dress, you know, just, just learning how to make distinctions, it, it, it's so valuable and it's such a big part. You know, I think most people would agree that the, the Jews are not a dumb people. <laughs> we tend to be a smart people. Part of that may be the evolutionary pressure of being persecuted in every generation. It's like the smart ones survive. But it's also uh, this nurturing of the, you know, the, the, the what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, the, 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 the thinking faculty, but the, 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 especially the ability to make distinctions and to find nuance and to seek wisdom. All of that is what the Talmud is about. And when you went into that bookstore, something got you there on that day, something told you to pick that book. Was there any significance about that day, the date, something to do with your grandmother around a birthday or the time of her passing? What, what got you to the bookstore? What got you to pull out the Talmud on the seven and a half year cycle, which seems almost impossible? <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I, I've been in that bookstore, I'm telling you, more than a dozen times. And always had that same thought, like glance at those books. Okay, that's the Talmud. It's huge. I'd love to know what's in there, but not for me. Um, so in terms of what made me take the book off the shelf, you know, it's just some kind of push from above. Uh, in terms of why I was literally there that day, it was to replace a prayer book uh, that I had given away during a trip to Belgium. That's, 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 that's why I was there that day. I had gone to a Chabad house in Antwerp, Belgium, and I, had an, I recommend for people who are reconnecting with their Judaism uh, to get an interlineal translation uh, in, in a prayer book where, you know, it's like the Hebrew and right beneath every Hebrew word is its English translation. Uh, and it's just a great way to get, you know, to, to learn more Hebrew and to, to get familiarized with what you're really saying when you're praying in Hebrew. Uh, and it was a really useful book. And I was grateful for the experience I'd had at that Chabad house and gave them that, that prayer book and then needed to replace it when I got home. So since the cycle is seven and a half years, had your, when had your grandmother passed? Well, that's interesting because she died in 97 uh, and, and this was 2005. Right. And, and, and it turned out that it was seven and a half years later. And when I actually looked it up, she didn't die on the day of the previous Tafiomi cycle, but it was like a week and a half off. You know, it was kind of amazing how close that was. I'd never heard of Tafiomi until the day I bought the book. Um, but when I went back and looked it up. Um, so, yeah, so, so then, uh, so she died right around the time of that, that previous cycle. Then the one that I did ended in August of 2012. Uh, and it was around that time that I started, you know, blogging and the Facebook page and everything that we've done. I didn't continue doing Dafyomi in the next, I, I did for about a year, but then it was like, okay, you know, I, I don't have another hour a day for another seven and a half years. <laughs> um, now I'm so busy sharing all this other Jewish wisdom content. I mean, a lot from the Talmud, but not necessarily on that daily cycle. Well, that next cycle ended January 5th, 2020. 
by that point, you know, a year ago, okay, so now I have this big audience. I'm called the accidental Talmudist. Uh, they actually told my story at, at, at a big CUM Hashas of, in the 2020 uh, completion of that cycle. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I should just try teaching the Dafyom. You know, it's called the Dafyom Mishir. And, and not, not the whole page. I mean, there's so many rabbis who can teach the whole page. But again, you know, taking a few key ideas from that day's page and communicating in the way that I communicate with my audience, why don't I just give this a try? I'm not gonna commit to a seven and a half years of teaching every day, uh, but I'll just go live at least the first few days and see how this goes and see if anyone is interested. Um, and I just started going live, like literally with my phone on my desk in front of me uh, in, in portrait mode, like vertical. And the audience came, they were interested. So kind of over the last year it evolved, it, it went to 16 by nine horizontal. We added lights, we added going live on Facebook and YouTube. Every time I go live, I, you know, I have this bell, let's light up the darkness. <laughs> and I light the wisdom candle. Uh, and now, you know, I mean, it, <laughs> it's a big commitment because teaching an hour a day, every day, I teach at 6 p.m. Uh, Sunday through Thursday, noon on Friday as we're getting ready for Shabbos and Saturday night after Shabbos ends. So I teach seven days a week, uh, but a community has built around it. And as all these people who are sort of taking the journey with me. And of course, when you, it's, it's one thing to learn something, you know, just reading, studying it for yourself. When you're teaching it, you're learning it at a whole different level. Uh, so it's this massive commitment. Now I have to, you know, read my DAF and prepare the class and then teach the class and then kind of write down a few notes so it's searchable. So now it's not an hour a day. Now it's, you know, two, two and a half hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, but, you know, what can I say? It, it, God put the book in my hands. <laughs> so these things have happened and I got to stay with it. Um, and I'm so glad to be able to be a conduit uh, of this wisdom, you know, like I said before, to all these people in far-flung communities who would just not be learning otherwise. And it, it, you know, it, it, it's so relevant to them. It matters so much to them. So it's been nice. I wanna go back to the, the day you were with your grandma and the rest of your family. But first, if people wanna find you, what are all the ways that they can do that? Are, are there accidental, accidental Talmudist.org. That's, that's the easiest way. Uh, that's our website, uh, but also Accidental Talmudist on Facebook. Uh, and there's also a Facebook group uh, and there's an email, but if you just, you know, either one, Accidental Talmudist on Facebook or the website uh, .org is, is, is where you can find everything that we do. And we have a podcast as well. We have many wonderful guests and there's, there's a lot of ways to consume our content. Uh, in, including we have the best collection of Jewish jokes on earth, <laughs> uh, all the best jokes. And I've rewritten all of them uh, to make them just a, you know, a little smoother, a little funnier, a little better, kind of like you know, our version of the best jokes on earth uh, and all illustrated with an image. So if you like great Jewish jokes told in their best form, that's another thing you'll find there. Nina writes, uh, the Thursday Heroes column, amazing stories of unsung heroes, uh, often, you know, righteous Gentiles who saved Jews during the Holocaust or Jews who saved Jews or non-Holocaust heroes, uh, modern, but, you know, just, just heroic stories that you may not have heard before. There's just lots and lots of content there and we welcome everybody. And by the way, uh, there's probably more non-Jews than Jews in our audience. Um, I mean, there's just a lot more non-Jews than Jews in the world. Uh, but it's so interesting how many non-Jews recognize, you know, the, the, the authenticity and the time-tested nature of this wisdom that goes back thousands of years uh, and, and how much of a boon it is to meaningful living. That was my question is what different religions or backgrounds 
of people do you notice that are asking you there, questions? There are a lot of Christians, um, you know, who, who are interested uh, because, I mean, you know, their Bible is an extension of the Hebrew Bible and, um, you know, and, 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 and and the figure at the at the at the center of their religion was a Jew, uh, so that often makes them curious, uh, you know, about how did he live and what was his time and what was the, what was it like for him to be alive? And you know, Jesus lived in the Talmudic era, uh, and so there's there's quite a bit that you can learn about about his world by studying with us. Um, we're not an interfaith effort. You know, it, it, it's not that we're out there to make, you know, to make connections between Judaism and other religions. We're just teaching authentic Judaism and we welcome everybody who wants to learn. Uh, we also have huge numbers of people following us in India, uh, mm -hmm. in Pakistan, in Ethiopia, in Egypt, Nigeria. It's very, very interesting uh, how many people are interested uh, in, in this wisdom and in these practices uh, from other parts of the world. That day being with your grandma when she took her last breath here, did, um, did anyone else in the family notice? And what else did you notice going on? Uh, my question is really- Great question. Yeah, so first I'll ask that, but I have another question. Great question. Um, you know, I didn't even say anything about it that day. On that day, it was like very special to me, but you know, I was just a rationalist. I, I just, I, you know, I'm sure it was in my imagination. Uh, you know. um, so after I've been telling this story for a few years and I, that time in Australia at a, at a Limud learning conference, uh, I said, you know what? I can't believe I never asked my brother <laughs> what he experienced. So I went, I went to him and, and, and unfortunately I didn't get a chance to ask my mom um, because by the time I was sort of ready to talk about it, she had dementia um, and I wasn't able to talk to her about that. But I did ask my brother. Now my brother is truly a rationalist. He, he's an interventional cardio, cardiologist, uh, you know, very prominent in his field, very scientifically oriented, kind of no nonsense kind of guy. And, uh, and I just said to him, I didn't even say my story to him. I said to him, so, you know, we called her Ita. Um, when Ita died, did you experience anything unusual? And he said, it's funny you asked me that. So, so he, as an interventional cardiologist, he has saved huge numbers of lives. I mean, he saves lives all the time. It's like just part of the job. <laughs> saving lives but you can't save them all sometimes the people are just you know the heart problems are too great they're too far gone by the time he gets called in there's just nothing any any doctor could do so he's been present at many deaths um and and he says that you know every time he's present when a person dies first of all it's profound you don't get used to that you know even somebody who's around it all the time it's not like it's just like whatever you know, there's no whatever about a, a living person dying. Um, but what he said he's, he's noticed over the years is that like in that moment, you know, when, when death occurs, there's like a charge, he describes it as a charge in the room. And he says it's a little bit like if you've ever been in Florida, uh, where it's very humid, right before a big you know, lightning and thunderstorm, there's like an electric, literally an electricity in the air. And he says, it's something like that. Like there's this charge in the room and sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's weaker, but I always feel it. Um, and sometimes this comes up in a conversation with the family of the person who has passed and they always feel it and they feel it much more than I feel it you know, because they're, they're connected to that, to the person who died. He said, when Ita died, I felt that same feeling, but it was about 10,000 times stronger than when I'm just the doctor in the room and don't have a you know, real relationship with the person who died. He said, but what was really strange about when Ita died is I somehow had the feeling that there were two charges in the room. Like there were two presences in the room. 
And then I told him when I experienced, he's like, well, it makes perfect sense. You know, it was Ita and Imre. Um, so there you go. And did you, was there anything else about, most people call it a shared death experience. Did you see anything else for past, her present, anything about your grandfather who was pulling her in? Um, and any physical feeling you had, did you feel also a pull? Uh, I, I mean, I, yes, in the sense that I, you know, it's like this extraordinary vision was happening there. I, I, I didn't feel like, you know, like, like, like a pull to me to leave the world. Um, but, but I, I, it was, I was so involved in what was going on, you know, it was, it was amazing to me that, as, that I, I was included in it you know, uh, that, 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 that they were having this moment and somehow they, I was able or I was allowed to bear witness to it. Um, you know, and, I, and, and, and I, I almost don't know why, uh, except that it affected me so much and look at everything that's come from it. So maybe that's the answer uh, of why, you know, I, I was given that gift. Um, I, you know, I feel like, you know, well, these days you can talk about these kinds of things, but, you know, there, there are certain experiences that you can have uh, that I think are related to shared death experiences, you know, um, and, you know, kind of like trance moments, uh, peak moments, ephem like, 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 like these moments where you're, you know, you tap into something or you're, you're privy to that upper world. Uh, you know, some would say psychedelic experiences uh, are related to that. Sometimes it happens through meditation or through the breath, or sometimes you get into a state of flow. There's, there's sort of like different ways. Sometimes it just happens in nature at a particular moment where everything seems perfect. Um, but sometimes you get access, you know, to, to that world. And I feel like, like what, what that world is like is very different than this world. Another place that you get access to some some part of that world is when you're dreaming, you know. And and the Talmud teaches that when you have a dream that's powerful and stays with you, you know, we dream all the time. But sometimes you have a dream that you, you know you're shaken by it. It's not necessarily because it was terrifying. It's just some something profound about it. It's important to you, so it's important. And when that happens. Don't just let it go. Oh, well, I woke up, I guess it was a powerful dream, but whatever, dreams are forgotten so easily. When you have that kind of a dream, the Talmud says that a dream not interpreted is like a letter not read, you know? And, 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 and so you have to ask yourself, what did that mean? You know, if, if that was a communication from above that's meant to inspire me to do something in this world, maybe to get on mission, uh, you know, what is that communication? What, what aspect of my mission am I not fulfilling or I could fulfill better or, you know, I, could, I need to make a redirection in my life? You need to ask that question. And often to ask the question is to receive an answer. Um, and what that upper world is like is it's so fluid, just like your dreams are fluid, like a psychedelic experience is fluid, like a a shared death experiences fluid or people who had near death experiences, right? Is, isn't it like constantly shifting? It, there's like a lot of light there and, and whatever's going on can just, you know, so fluidly change into something else. And, and, and so what that world is not, what that world is not is static. Our world is much firmer and more static than that world. You know, like this, this is a bell, like it remains a bell. It's solid, you know? In that world, it could be a bell and then it could just turn into something else. And, and you're so easily distracted. I feel that, I, I talk about this because of my mother, you know, she has this dementia, uh, it came on very fast. It's very, very, very advanced. She's not verbal anymore, really. And, you know, I sit with her uh, and I think, you know, I, I don't think that nothing is going on there. I think a lot is going on the person has dementia and and one theory about that is like 
part of what their dementia is, is that the normal filter between us and that world, and that needs to be a strong filter. Because if you start experiencing, you know, what it would be like when you're, you know, tripping balls <laughs> at a concert or in the middle of a powerful dream, if you start to have an experience like that, you know, when you're driving the carpool, you're a hazard to yourself and others. You know, we, we need to not be in that world when we're, you know, fulfilling our mission here as humans on earth. We need to be grounded in the real world and it's solid mass and where cars, you know, can crash into each other, et cetera. Um, but that world is not like that, you know? And it's almost like, you know, you have an experience like this, you come back, you can't really imagine what that world is like. It's so hard to hang on to what that was like when you're here. And I believe that when you're there, it's gonna be very difficult to remember what this was. When it was solid, when it was unchanging, when it was, when it was static, it's very hard for, for the souls in that world to, to remain connected to here. Because in that state, this like doesn't make sense. This stuff here, it doesn't make sense. And that's why there's not, there's, all, there's so little connection between the two worlds. So few people have connections. It's not tenable to sort of keep that pipeline open. And that's why we only get these glimpses now and then. Typically when people share death experience or near death experience, because you had a touch of the other realm, did anything linger for a week or a month? Anything where you felt more attuned to this world or did you have any dreams? Did, you know, how did it, how did it affect you in terms of sensitivity? So, so long ago, uh, I remember it was 24 years ago. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't remember, you know, how I felt that week uh, when I came back. But, but I will say that, okay, so when I went to that synagogue that day, you know, and I said I was very moved. So actually, yeah, no, so there was a connection, uh, a very strong one. So I, I went to that synagogue. I kind of sat in the back by myself. I didn't know anybody. Um, you know, I really enjoyed when the rabbi spoke. That was good. But what really moved me uh, was during the, uh, the Musaf Amida, right? So the, the standing prayer that you say after the Torah service. And in that synagogue, the cantor had composed a very beautiful melody for the part we sing Lador Vador from generation to generation. And they had a choir. Uh, it was like Lador Vador, Lador Vador. Na, 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 na. na da, 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 da. I'm not a good singer, but it was something like that. And um, and so, but, but the, the word, and I didn't even know Hebrew. Like, I didn't even think I realized that they were singing from generation to generation. But they were, and during that melody, so I, like, I've only like, you know, felt like I saw something, you know, like a, some kind of a vision twice in my life. Once was my, my grandmother's bedside. And the other time was two weeks later in that synagogue. And what it was, uh, I was sitting in the back of that, you know, very large sanctuary filled with people. I mean, they get a big turnout on Saturday. There are probably two, 3,000 people there. And, um, and they're singing that melody. And what I saw was, it looked like, you know, like a Gothic arch, you know, two very tall columns, and then they kind of meet high up. Uh, so I felt like there were two columns of light, one on each side of the room, going up like infinitely high. Uh, and when I look closer at them, this is why I say Gothic columns, like they weren't just made of light, they were made of people, right? souls. Like they, they were souls stacked up on top of each other. Uh, and I realized they're my ancestors. You know, they're my ancestors uh, who have all been part of this Jewish tradition and they were welcoming me home. I should have mentioned this. <laughs> the story's so long, I haven't done tell this part of it. But yeah, I, I felt like they were welcoming me home uh, and actually say, 
where you been? <laughs> You're 32 years old. What the hell have you been waiting for? <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it didn't last a long time, but I was, I mean, I cried a lot at my grandmother's bedside. It was like waterworks sitting in that synagogue that day, just, just like, like water pouring out of my eyes. I was almost like a little embarrassed. People were looking at me like, well, you know, what's going on with this guy? Um, and, uh, and, and that, those are the two times, you know, that I've had an actual sort of peek at this. Uh, so you're right. And that happened two weeks after that other experience. It's incredible. My final question about that day with your grandma is, for those of us who have not experienced that, is there any way you can describe it? Did the room geom geometrically shift? What made you turn your head to look in the center of the room? And did it look like, did it look real, like real people or was it um, ghostly? You know, how do you describe that to people who don't, who can't understand? You know, what's funny here is, I mean, I'm a storyteller, I'm a professional storyteller. And, uh, you know, I've told the story so many times that it's almost like the words of the narrative have taken over the memory, you know? And, and sometimes I wonder when I imagine it, am I imagining the way I would imagine when I'm hearing a story? And I, I always, I, I have a kind of visual mind. So like, if you tell me a story, I start to picture it. Um, so am I picturing what I'm describing or am I describing <laughs> what I saw? Um, I, I know it's the same, but it's not exactly the same. You know, so I can't quite take myself back. I should probably just do that exercise the way I take an actor through a sense memory. You know, you know, is there? I remember that at the moment she took her last breath, my mom kind of shrieked, and uh, and 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 I was wearing a white T-shirt, and you know, you tear your clothing when a close relative dies and she tore the collar of my shirt uh, and she tore my brother's shirt and she tore her own. Um, and so it must have happened like right after that. So maybe that's all, also a little bit of what triggered me away. Um, but what I definitely remember is, is, is that shimmering, that, that, that shimmering of the air. Um, you know, it was almost like a like like a like like a preparation for the opening. It wasn't just open, like it it it, it opened. You know, that's what I remember. Is there any else anything else you want to say about your shared death experience or your the accidental Talmudist? I know my question is for people who want to find you. Do you have books? I know you have a movie. How, how do we find your uh, your creations? Oh, what else? Do you um, want to well, our movies are on. Uh, Amazon Prime and Apple TV and Roku, most major platforms. Um, you, you can go to my name also, you know, there's a, there's a links to our movies on accidentaltelmodus.org. So if you just want to remember one site, that's the easiest one. Uh, but the, you know, the two movies that we made that were released theatrically were When Do We Eat? A, a, a pretty raucous and irreverent yet Torah drenched uh, Passover comedy, Dysfunctional Family Seder. Uh, when do we eat? And then we also made a movie about Abraham Lincoln and his closest friend. That's called Saving Lincoln. Um, very, very different movie, uh, a historical drama. However, it's interesting. Uh, you know, like we, we, we take you through the whole Civil War from the perspective of, of Abraham Lincoln and his wife, Mary. And Lincoln was an incredibly sweet man. You know, he himself said, How is it that I, you know, who, have, who cannot wring the neck of a chicken have been placed in charge, you know, of the armies of the nation and, 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 and a level of bloodshed that, that no one had ever experienced or imagined before. I mean, that war was so deadly that there had never been anything like it. And there were new forms of warfare. So in a nation of 30 million people, 700,000 men died. You know, to think about that, that's like, we're now 300 million. So it's, it would be as if 7 million Americans die. 
uh, and you know, now having come through COVID, that a number like that even starts to take on a little bit more meaning than it would have before going, going through this plague. But you know, I think we're approaching 600,000 COVID deaths. You know, and a lot of people who included in that might, you know, might have perished of a flu or something. But you know, seven million to die, violent deaths or disease deaths in the trenches. There was so much death uh, in the air, as it were, in America. And the Lincolns themselves were not spared. So, you know, Lincoln was incredibly close to his son, Willie, uh, who I think was 11 years old, 11 or 12, I can't remember right now, but 11 or 12, uh, when he died, you know, from like there was dysentery in Washington, D.C., and, and, and the boy was taken from them. Uh, and Mary never recovered. And, and seeking to sort of reunite with her son, she joined a huge number of Americans who were very interested in spiritualism, specifically meaning contacting, communicating with the dead. Now, of course, there were a lot of frauds who you know, were preying on, on, on the despair of the American population. And yet there are also many stories from that time uh, of, you know, communications from beyond where information was gleaned that just could not have been known by, by the medium, by, by anybody except, you know, the dead and, and the one receiving the message through the medium. Uh, and, and Nettie Colburn was, was one such medium. And there were seances in the White House. And we actually depict one in the movie in Saving Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln was very much a rationalist, you know, and, and he had trouble with this. Uh, but was affected by it. And, you know, and, and toward the end, you know, he, he ended up dying just, just a very short few days after the war ended. Uh, and he would, and, and, and the movie's about the friendship between Lincoln and his, his bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamon, who saved his life more than once and would have saved it at the very end if Lincoln had not sent him away three days before. Why did Lincoln send uh, Lamon away? Uh, just at that time when it was known that his life was in danger. It was known that there were Southern sympathizers who wanted to kill uh, the president. And yet he sent his bodyguard away. Uh, well, to, to understand that, see the movie. But, but some of these issues that we've been talking about, you know, come up uh, and not in some fanciful context, but in a, you know, a real historical and dramatic context. Thank you, Sal. Is there, are there any other comments that you wanted to mention about the death experience or the accidental tumblinus? Anything else you can think of that I forgot to ask? No, I guess the only thing, you know, it's always good to mention what you're working on now. <laughs> so um, on the accidental tumblinus side, uh, we're starting to develop an app so that will be even more convenient and available to more people in more ways. Uh, and uh, Nina and I are working on our next script for our next picture, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun or a, a thriller. During COVID, we sort, I sort of went back to film school and we watched either a thriller or a Western or a mystery, one movie a day, every day <laughs> through all of COVID, which has been a tremendous experience, you know, all of Hitchcock and, you know, so many other great directors. And, uh, and this new movie is a thriller. It's, it's definitely got strong Jewish content, uh, but it, it's called Guns and Moses, and it's gonna be a very exciting uh, and action-packed thriller. So watch for Guns and Moses in a few years. Love the title. Thank you, Sal. That was so wonderful. I feel like we need a part two. <laughs> Always happy to work with you. I, I got to say, you are an excellent uh, interviewer. Well done. Uh, this is very enjoyable conversation, and I hope that uh, your audience enjoyed it too. Thank you. Well, it's so easy when the information in your journey is so interesting. So thank you for your time today. No problem. All the best. All right. To you, Anina, too.